A lot of litigation over agency regulations or challenges to agency regulations involve questions of statutory interpretation where the agency has had to interpret maybe an arguably ambiguous statute or uh, implement a regulation where this, on a point that the statute is silent about. And the question is, what do courts do and how do courts handle statutory interpretation? That's what we're going to be looking at in this case. It's a 2024 decision from the U.S. Supreme Court, Garland v. Cargill. It's actually about the ATF's bump stock ban. And we're, it gives a nice illustration of what happens when a court, the Supreme Court or other courts look at the statute and decide that the agency read it wrong or came up with an interpretation that doesn't fit with the statutory language and therefore its regulation is invalidated. I'm Drew Stevenson. This is for my administrative law class. Let's dive in. So our big takeaway from Garland v. Cargill is that agency regulations must fit within the relevant statutory text that the regulation implements, at least how the court interprets that text. Cargill is from the same term that the court overruled Chevron in 2024. Actually, they came out, the two cases came out within a few weeks of each other. And I think that the case illustrates how courts are likely to proceed after Loper Bright. So let's talk about some basic facts. This story kind of starts in 2017 with an horrific tragedy. A mass shooter in Las Vegas used a bump stock device to simulate machine gun fire from semi-automatic rifles. Um, he was from a high level um, hotel room and sprayed um, gunfire at a concert that was an outdoor concert that was happening on the ground uh, beneath his window, killing 58 people and wounding more than 500, many of whom still um, are living with debilitating injuries uh, from being shot. There was a uh, national uh, outcry over this incident. And a few months later in 2018, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, usually known as ATF, promulgated a regulation banning these bump stock devices. Now, let's talk about the statute. The National Firearms Act of 1934, that's from the New Deal era, defines a machine gun as any weapon which shoots, is designed to shoot, or can be readily restored to shoot automatically more than one shot without manual reloading by a single function of the trigger. That's at 26 USC 5845B. Now, the crucial line in the statute and this definition for this case is what I put in bold, a single function of the trigger. And this is pretty typical in administrative law cases that there's one particular word or phrase that's the kind of crux of the case and is the um, question about whether the agency's regulation is valid. Now, this um, machine gun ban, and at first it was just a prohibitively expensive tax that made machine guns unaffordable to most people. Um, and then eventually, decades later, Congress added another statute that made it illegal to um, manufacture and sell new machine guns. So most of the machine guns currently in circulation are um, rather old. Now, this statute has long been considered to apply to machine gun conversion devices. So if you get a gun that's a semi-automatic and it's not a machine gun and you get an accessory or a conversion kit and manage to convert it into a fully automatic machine gun, you could still face criminal prosecution um, if you're caught. Now, bump stocks are in some ways different, in some ways they're not. When a shooter pulls and holds the trigger on a rifle equipped with a bump stock accessory, the device uses the gun's movements to make the trigger mechanism repeat very rapidly. So the shooter basically just holds, press, holds the trigger, depresses the, their finger on the trigger, and the vibrations from the gun make the trigger mechanism re, refire again and again. And so mechanically, this is not a true machine gun conversion device, but the effect is very similar. A continuous rapid firing for the killing potential, for example, is um, pretty similar. Now, 
back to ATF's rule from 2018. Uh, the ATF said that uh, if a regular gun has a bump stock, then it is in fact now a machine gun under the statute and therefore illegal. Note that this was a change from ATF's prior position a few years earlier. We'll come back to that later. Now, various gun rights groups challenged this new regulation in courts all over the country, as did Mr. Cargill, who was a Texas gun store owner who had previously sold the devices. Now, I do want to make sure you're clear on something if you're watching this video. This is not a Second Amendment case. The, uh, this Supreme Court never mentions the Second Amendment in the case. This is not a constitutional case. The court's opinion is only about whether ATF's interpretation of the relevant statutory definition is correct. That being said, some of the lower court decisions that dealt with challenges to the bump stock regulation did in fact discuss uh, the Second Amendment issue um, and or uh, thought that it was an issue that uh, could invalidate the regulation, but it was not a live issue in the case that went to the US Supreme Court. Um, now, the lower courts split. As I mentioned, this was challenged around the country. And uh, before we get to the US Supreme Court, there had been a circuit split over the validity of this regulation. And not only that, but within each circuit, the judges on each panel had split. There were concurring and dissenting opinions about how to approach this case. And I also want you to be aware that there were other legal issues going on in these challenges in the lower courts. Uh, one was an administrative law issue that was the fact that there was an acting attorney general um, at the time that the regulation was initiated. They eventually, the courts decided that that wasn't an issue, but it was litigated. There's, uh, there was some discussion about the rule of lenity, which is a doctrine from criminal law about ambiguous statutes being construed in favor of the defendant, and importantly, whether Chevron deference applied. And of course, as I said, some of the lower courts wrestled with the Second Amendment implications of this ban. Whether and how much Chevron applied was especially unclear. Some judges wanted to abandon Chevron deference completely, which the Supreme Court itself was in fact about to do. It's even more complicated than that in this case though, because ATF and the government had waived Chevron deference in this specific case. And courts around the country were divided at the time about whether Chevron applies anyway, even when the government is saying that it doesn't. And there was also a split of authority about um, whether Chevron deference applied to regulations that carried criminal penalties like this one. So let's talk a little bit about the policy reversal. We're gonna talk about this now and later in the, uh, this video as well. There was an issue with ATF's reversal of its prior position about bump stocks. Now, I do want to say, just to clarify, the prior endorsements of the devices were not in the form of promulgated regulations that had the force of law, but they were rather individual opinion letters or ruling letters. Um, for, to specific manufacturers. And agencies can reverse those. They're not set in stone for all time. Although there's a long line of cases going back to the New Deal era that if an agency has taken one position generally with regards to the uh, um, regulated industry for many years and then abruptly changes its position, the courts are going to apply more scrutiny under a variety of different doctrines. So let's talk about the holding in Garland v. Cargill. The court split six to three on party lines. Justice Thomas wrote for the majority, declaring that the statutory definition of machine gun unambiguously excludes bump stocks because the trigger does in fact move a little bit each time the gun fires, even if the person's finger doesn't move. Um, this, of course, raises a question we're going to come back to later. If the statute is clear, why is there a circuit split? But he argued that there is only one way to read the statute. 
Here's a quote I pulled out from the opinion for those of you who like to highlight in your cases. Quote, we hold that a semi-automatic rifle equipped with a bump stock is not a machine gun because it cannot fire more than one shot by a single function of the trigger. And even if it could, it could not do so automatically. ATF therefore exceeded its statutory authority by issuing a rule that classifies bump stocks as machine guns. Now, I want to zero in on that one particular line from that. ATF therefore exceeded its statutory authority and make sure my students understand what's going on here. Note how ATF exceeded its statutory authority in this case. It's because its interpretation didn't square with the statutory language, at least according to the majority. It's not because ATF lacks rulemaking authority, although some people have argued that, um, or that it promulgated regulations about guns, which it appears even from this opinion that the Bureau can do as long as its regulations fit with the statute. Okay, we have a concurring opinion from Justice Alito that is worth talking about for just a moment. Just as Alito wrote a concurrence, essentially inviting Congress to ban bump stocks by statute. So he's not saying bump stocks are great. And uh, again, that they're, the second amendment protects them or anything like that. He seems to suggest that Congress could easily have banned, have banned these instead of ATF. And there's a curious line he has in his opinion, there can be little doubt that, Cong that the Congress that enacted 26 USC 5845 would not have seen a material difference between a machine gun and a semi-automatic rifle equipped with a bump stock. Now for my students, I want you to note something about statutory interpretation here that previous generations of textualists back, let's say in the 80s and 90s, argued that textualism as, as a means of interpretation was simply the best or most reliable way to determine the intent of Congress. But here, things have evolved a bit, and this is a different type of textualism where he's saying, we know that Congress, that when they pass a statute, would have wanted to ban bump stocks, or would have wanted the statute to apply uh, to bump stocks. But too bad they didn't phrase it quite, quite that way. Um, they used they chose different wording, and so they're going to have to enact a new statute if they want the ban to apply. And so this is a, a little bit of a strange type of textualism, a very modern type of textualism that says, I don't care that I know full well what Congress intended. Um, instead, I'm focusing on the words of the text of the statute kind of divorced from um, the obvious congressional intent. Now we have a dissent from Justice Sotomayor. It was joined by Justices Kagan and Jackson. She begins by emphasizing the crisis of gun violence in our society and the destructive power of bump stocks. Bump stocks are very dangerous. Um, they're not terribly useful unless you're wanting to just spray a crowd with bullets. Um, and then she goes on to a more, a somewhat uh, interesting legal point, which is that legalizing bump stocks essentially undermines the um, statute itself because it gives a workaround. Uh, all you have to do is get this accessory and you can have something that's has essentially the same killing power as a machine gun or is functionally an equivalent even if it's not mechanically identical. And so basically the court's decision, she argues, thwarts the purpose of the statute and makes the statute irrelevant. And that's a question that comes up a lot in statutory interpretation. Are we interpreting the statute in a way that essentially nullifies the statute or makes it meaningless? And unsurprisingly, she and the other dissenters interpret the statute to focus on the human actor, the shooter who's pulling the trigger. Guns don't just go around shooting themselves. Um, and while the majority focuses on the trigger mechanism itself. And this is an issue that also comes up again and again in statutory interpretation in administrative law with agencies, is if we assume that the law is to regulate human actions and human behavior, should we read 
laws through the lens of assuming that it's taught that we through the lens of the human action that would violate the statute. And that's what the dissent does here. While the majority just focuses on the kind of mechanics or physics of what's going on inside the gun. And this is, there's no right answer to this question, but I want my students to be aware of it, that if you look at a statute through the lens of the human action or choice or activity that would violate the statute, sometimes it could make you get a different result in how you read it than if you look at it as a law about machines or physical objects themselves. And here's a quote where she talks about that and then talks about another surprising feature of this opinion. The majority looks to the internal mechanism that initiates fire rather than the human act of the shooter's initial pull to hold that a, the, the phrase, a single function of the trigger means a reset of the trigger mechanism. And then she goes on, its interpretation requires six diagrams and an animation to decipher the meaning of the statutory text. This is a jab at the majority opinion. One unique feature or unusual feature of the Cargill case is that the majority opinion includes several pictures or diagrams of um, bump stock mechanisms and trigger mechanisms on a gun that Justice Thomas took from one of the amicus briefs. And uh, just as this is kind of a dig of saying, if the statute is so clear and obviously means one thing, why do you need to draw six pictures to explain it? Why, if the words aren't clear enough themselves without diagrams? Okay, let's talk about um, this uh, kind of uh, another bigger question with interpreting statutes. In this particular case, the Cargill case, it first went to a district court and the judge in that court read the statute and said, I think a bump stock actually fits the statutory definition of a machine gun. It gets appealed to the Fifth Circuit and the three judge panel of the Fifth Circuit initially also agreed that the statute applied. And then they asked for a rehearing on bank and the full panel of the Fifth Circuit reversed the prior panel and the district court. And then even for the Enbank panel the, um, in, of the Fifth Circuit, they said that the statute was ambiguous, not clear, but they thought that they, we should therefore apply the doctrine of lenity or the rule of lenity and invalidate the statute because um, criminal sanctions were involved. But that's not what the majority uh, does in this case. So I want you to think about this. So we have a circuit split. We had varying opinions back and forth between the judges and, um, and the judges even on the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. So what should agencies do when an executive branch officials or agency heads have to implement a statute? They've been tasked with that by Congress. How should they start? Where do they start given that so many judges will disagree with each other about what the relevant statute means? And of course, the U.S. Supreme Court gets to just settle these questions once and for all, but that, that's a process that's years off in the future. So how should an official choose the best interpretation before the U.S. Supreme Court decides which one is correct? Now, I want to go back to this issue of the agency changing its position. The Cargill opinion emphasized, although it seems to be in dicta, it wasn't part of the holding, that prior ATF rulings had taken the opposite position. As I mentioned, this invites has always invited a little more judicial scrutiny. Um, a few weeks later, when the Supreme Court put out Loper Bright v. Raimondo, the court mentioned consistency over time as uh, impacting how much respect courts should now give to agency interpretations of the agency's own statute. And students should keep that in mind when you are practicing in the area of administrative law, that an agency changing its, its mind means that the agency gets somewhat less weight. It's not dispositive, it's not the end of the matter, but the agency will get a little less weight for its interpretation when we get into court because they've, they've, they haven't um, taken the same position all along. There's also an issue that comes up in Loper Bright that could be relevant for Cargill, although in the, the Cargill opinion doesn't really make a big deal out of it. Loper Bright said 
interpretations issued contemporaneously with the statute at issue and which have remained consistent over time may be especially useful in determining the statute's meaning. So under Loper Bright, if a statute gets enacted and an agency immediately promulgates a regulation interpreting it and then sticks with that, apparently that's going to be given more weight by the courts than an agency adopting a regulation, promulgating a regulation that interprets a an old statute from generations ago. Now, sometimes agencies have to do that because there's new technology, right? Bump stocks weren't really in circulation in the 1930s or society has changed or there's a new president in the White House who has a a mandate from a voter mandate, he, he feels, to change some of our policies. And so keep in mind that ATF's 2018 bump stock interpretation was for a 1934 law. The opinion here doesn't make a big deal out of that, but it can matter after Loper Bright in future cases. Now, where does this leave us about machine guns? Well, uh, machine guns are still illegal and under they didn't overturn the statute. It was just the regulation. And the court noted in footnote four, seemingly with approval that ATF had banned other um, conversion devices, uh, auto sears, that are true conversion attachments that basically really do turn a semi-automatic gun into a fully automatic gun. Um, and it's worth keeping in mind in terms of societal impact that auto sear devices, the ones that the court that are still banned, are used in crimes far more often than bump stocks, and they remain illegal. And if you're caught with one you can face prosecution and um, a hefty sentence. And that concludes our um, lecture about Garland v. Cargill, a statutory interpretation case involving an agency regulation from 2024.